speaker, very excited uh, to have him. I asked him, how do you pronounce your name? And he went, don't, which is kind of <laughs> awesome. And I said, well, I got to call you something. And he said, just call me Massey. So without further ado, everybody, Massey. Thanks, everybody. So uh, I'm Massey. I'm a software engineer at Datadog. Uh, I work on the agent in in integrations team. I used to do mostly C++ and Python in the past. Nowadays, it's just Python and Go. Uh, I want to mention that I'm, I'm an open source software fan and contributor. So a few words about Datadog. Uh, Datadog is a software as a service providing infrastructure, uh, application, and more recently, logs monitoring. The most common use case is you run our agent on your machines, and the agent collects events and metrics and send those data to our backend where data is processed and we can provide you meaningful visualizations like dashboards and alerting. Just to give you a sense of the throughput we handle, we process something like trillions of data points each day. This is a subset of the, what we call integrations. So the softwares like databases, services that we can collect metrics from. And for something like 75 of those integrations, uh, they are implemented in Python and they are run by our agent. Few details about how this works. So our, our agent is written in Python and it runs as a, some sort of daemon. Uh, users can configure the checks they want to perform on their system. So let's say I want to run the Postgres and do this check. When the agent starts, it loads the Python modules implementing those checks, and every 15 seconds, it goes through all of them one by one. Then another, they collect metrics, send upstream, and then the agent waits another 15 seconds, and so on, and so on. This is how the every check looks like. It's just a Python class uh, implementing some sort of best media term interface. So the class has to have this check method, which is called by the agent. And usually in the, in, in the body of this method, you, you have the logic to collect the metrics and the events. And you can use the uh, Python API provided by the base class to send those data to our backend. So you, the, the average check is way more complex than this, but you get the idea. Uh, so the agent is a, is a great piece of software, I have to say, but it's quite old. So the number of issues that needs like a complete rewrite of the software started to pile up in the past couple of years. So we needed to do something. We need to have uh, the next generation agent. But we have two strong requirements. So, okay, let's rewrite it, but it has to be smaller and faster. So smaller in memory footprint, uh, resource usages, and smaller. Faster in collection and forwarding metrics. And another like, blocking requirement was we need to keep Python around. Uh, that's mainly because we have, again, we have about 75 Python checks that we don't want to rewrite from scratch. Also because Python is I think is the right tool for implementing most of them. And also, we have a, customers can use, they can write their own custom checks in Python, and, they, and the agent is able to run those custom checks. And we couldn't just go to our customers telling, OK, you know what, you have to port your Python code to Go. Oh, and another thing, if you make a change to, to one of your checks, you have to recompile the entire agent, because it runs as a fat binary. So no way, we had to keep uh, Python around. So we re rewrote our agent in Go, and let's have a look at how we kept Python around. So Python can be embedded. This means that from your Go application, you can load an inter and then like a full-fledged Python interpreter in memory, and you can make it run Python code at will. Uh, CPython, which is the reference Python implementation, provides uh, an API written in C to, you know, to, to provide embedding. And CGO, you can use CGO to call C code from Go packages. So bingo. 
So let's have a look at how all of this works. Should be able to read the code, I hope. So let's say you have this Python module called foo, uh, containing a single function, printing hello world, cliche. And let's look at, how, let's say we want to run this Python code from Go. Uh, so we have this simple main. You might notice that we are using Cgo under the hood, but you don't see any Cgo instruction here. That's because I'm using this fancy uh, open source project called Go Python that basically maps the C API exposed from Python to to Go one one, so that we can actually call use the function exposed by the C API as they were normal. Go functions, so we can use strings and call regular functions. So whenever you want to use Python, you have, before you start using the interpreter, you have to initialize the internal state of the interpreter. Then you can, here, you can import a module. In this case, we want a module called foo. And then from this module, we can get the function called hello. At the end, we can call the function. So the parameters I need to pass is like its implementation detail for Python. We might ignore this for now. And let's see how it goes. Uh, the next thing is that we don't need any special tool. So we can use the go tool chain, even if we have cgo under the hood. So it just go build, and we can run the binary. I hope you can see this printing hello world. The cool thing is that I can change my Python code. And I don't really need to recompile anything. The same binary is able to load a different Python module. And that's pretty much it. Uh, of course, it's not that easy. <laughs> so let me introduce, the, introduce you the GIL. Uh, GIL stands for Global Interpreter Lock. And it's something that is quite common across interpreted languages. And of course, Python has its own GIL. Uh, the GIL is a, some sort of global lock that prevents multiple threads to run uh, at the same time, byte code at the same time. This means that e even if you have a Python multi-threaded application on a multi-core architecture, there's no way you can use more than one CPU at a time because of the GIL. When you embed CPython, of course, you embed also the GIL. And the problem is that the GIL knows about threads that are spawned, start, and stopped in the Python world. But if you run the Python interpreter from different threads in Go, the GIL can do really anything. So let's see another quick demo. And let's try to run the, some Python code for different Go routines. Uh, so the Python code is, has to be something more the, than the printing hello world because I need the CPU to do something. It's quite stupid. We just we have a for loop. So <clears throat> the code is very similar. Uh, we initialize the Python interpreter, and I have two Go routines running uh, Python code. I mean calling this function. So we call the do function from two different Go routines. And then we exit. So let's see what happens. OK, I, I will save you the huge stack trees. But basically, uh, a lot of things might happen in this case. We, we have plenty of opportunities to have race conditions, segmentation faults, uh, Python calling, uh, aborting the, the code. The point is it, it doesn't work and crashes most of the times. Not always, but most of the times. Uh, so how do we solve this problem? We basically have to handle the global interpreter lock by by our own. So what, what we do, we, first of all, 
we tell Python that we want to turn off the autopilot. We, don't, we are going to handle the GIL by ourselves. And to do this, we save the global state. And just remember to restore the global state before you exit. Otherwise, you have another segmentation fault. OK, so in between those two lines of code, we are on our own. We need to take care of the GIL. So what we're going to do, before calling any Python code, we lock the GIL. And when we are done, we can unlock the GIL. So let's see if this is better. Yep, it works. Thanks. <laughs> so we are good, right? Nope. Uh, what we did, we basically we locked and unlocked. We handled the guild from different go routines, which is not exactly the same things as having the same threads. Like this, the two different go routines can actually run on the same thread. The problem is that the the guild protects a specific thread. So, what might happen uh, actually is that you have two go routines, and the go runtime decides to pause. So you start the go routine, you lock the guild. Then the, the go runtime decides to pause that go routine and to resume later on a different thread. At that point, you are going to unlock the guild on a different thread. And this is not going to, to end well. So let's see another demo. Uh, the Python code is always the same. But I had to like trick the go runtime to force the go runtime to uh, post our, our go routines. So what I'm going to do is running some Python code, then sleep for a few milliseconds, and then run Python code again. This should be enough to convince the, the go runtime to, to stop the go routine. And to be sure that we want to shuffle things, so to be sure that the, uh, the go runtime might relocate one of our go routines to a different thread. Let's run 200 go routines, you know, just in case. Oh, and of course, we are handling the, the GIL correctly here. So we save this, the global state, and then we lock before executing Python. We are locked after executing Python. Everything seems right, OK? Uh, of course, it works. <laughs> this is, was the, the worst thing, because it's extremely hard to, to debug this kind of stuff, because it works most of the times. And it depends on what your laptop is doing, and a number of things, please crash. <laughs> I just try to recompile from scratch. Oh, oh finally! Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so in, in, in this case, instead of a segmentation fault, I don't want to, to go back to, through all the stack, but if you go up to, to the error, it's not a segmentation fault anymore. It's actually the Python interpreter saying, hey, you unlock the GIL from a thread and where the GIL was not locked. That, that's the error. And how do you fix this problem? Please don't throw me anything, but. <laughs> the only solution to this problem is to Tell the go runtime, hey, please stick this go routine with always the same thread. So at this point, I might rerun the demo, but you, you won't believe me anymore because. <laughs> How can you say it works? OK, you have just to trust me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, so once you are, you are embedding the Python interpreter, you can do also the other thing, the other thing, yeah, the other thing around. So you are embedding Python and you are calling Python code from Go, but when, while you are there, you can call Go code from Python. So uh, no demo here because I would, I would need to write some C code and I don't feel very comfortable. But the point is, uh, you create a, a virtual Python module that exists only in memory, in the Go uh, memory space. And you let the, um, the Python code running in the embedding interpreter import that module and call the function that actually maps to Go functions. Uh, let's have a quick look at the code. So let's say you have this Go function and just printing again the hello world. Uh, you might see the C Go preamble in this case. So we are going to export this function to the C word. Uh, this is the C module we, we need to map that Go function to something called my underscore func in the Python world. And the last instruction is like, we are asking to Python, please create this module in memory called my module containing my methods. And my methods are actually mapped Go functions. In the Python code, what you can do, you can do import my underscore module. What you are actually doing, you are importing a real Python module that only exists in memory. So of course, this Python code works only if you run it in the abandoned interpreter. So what we learn from, from this experience? Embedded, em, like the embedded Python plays really nice with Go. You can keep writing your idiomatic Go code. You can use Go routines, channels. You, you, don't have, you don't have to do anything different except handling the GIL, of course, but it's still idiomatic Go. The overhead to call Python is really close to zero. You don't have to, uh, to worry about it. And also, you have the opportunity to extend Python, so do the thing that I was talking about right before. Uh, what went not so good? Uh, the GIL prevents Python parallel execution, and this was expected. I mean, I come from the Python ecosystem. I know that I cannot run Python parallel code, Python code in parallel. The problem, and I didn't see this coming, is that the GIL actually feels the effects of the Go scheduler. And also, I tried to use multiple interpreters because, you know, you load a Python in memory, let's load two. The problem is that they are going to share the same GIL. Yeah. Evil geniuses. Yeah. Uh, the ugly part. So you, are, you likely have to carry on some C code. How much C code? That really depends on, you, on your use case. So it might not be such a problem. And you will likely need some Python code too, because you might want to provide some basic fun functionalities like base classes to the Python code that is going to run on your embedded interpreter. Uh, where are we now? So we, last week we just released the 6.0 beta 1 of the new agent, which is written in Go, and embeds C Python 2.7.13. It runs on Linux, OS X, and Windows. And we now run, instead of running the checks one after the other, the architecture is completely asynchronous. So we run checks concurrently, even if we know that Python checks will likely wait for each other. But we also rewrote some checks in, in Go. Like we, uh, you, you know, we found a couple of checks that actually never change. The code is always the same. The check reporting, the CPU metrics, the memory metrics never change. So we, we said, hey, let's write this in Go. It's faster and it's easier. And it can run in parallel. Uh, thanks for listening. So we open source the project. It would be nice if you can step by and maybe start the project on GitHub. And last but not least, if you like this kind of stuff, we are hiring. Thanks.
All right, thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Do we have a question back there? So to, to repeat the question, he's asking if you evaluated Grumpy. Yeah, yes, I did. Uh, so I uh, don't remember exactly why <laughs> uh, we didn't use Grumpy. Uh, so it basically, it compiles Python to Go, right? So the problem is, with this architecture, uh, one, once you start the agent, you can drop your Python code at runtime somewhere in the same uh, machine where the agent is running. And the agent is capable to pick up the Python code and execute it. I'm not sure you can do this with Grumpy. All right. Do we have other questions? I saw another hand here. Uh, sorry, didn't get the last part. Uh, on the slide, the bad, uh, one of the bullets was talking about how the kill don't be affected. Yeah. I, was, I didn't quite understand that. Oh, so the problem is, even if you are doing the right thing, like handling the gill, uh, the problem is that you lock and unlock the gill in Go routines, not in threads. And Specifically, the problem, the problem here is that you start a Go routine, and the Go runtime decides to run that Go routine on thread number one. And at some point, the, the Go runtime might decide that that Go routine can be paused because it's doing I.O. or whatever, for whatever reason. And when it's time to resume that Go routine, instead of uh, reattaching the Go routine to thread one, the Go routine might be executed on thread two. The point is, you lock the gill when the goroutine was running on thread one, and you are unlocking the gill on thread two. But on thread two, there was no lock. The lock was on thread one. So Python is like, hey, what are you trying to unlock? There is any mutex here. Hey, is it better? <laughs> Does anyone have additional questions? Another question here. Are you anticipating any challenges with um, like concurrency and scalability with having to acquire that lock through native code? Does, doesn't that kind of like sidestep the, like the concurrency model? So to, re to repeat, he's asking if you're anticipating scalability concerns with all the locking. Yeah, so here's the thing. The agent is going to run on, on a machine, and the average agent runs something like between two, three, maybe five checks. So scalability is not really an issue in my use case. But yeah, if you want to use such a thing on, you know, on a web server, uh, yeah, uh, maybe you need more information than I have right now. You should listen to the guy who created Node. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. my, my question is related to the gentleman's question. So, uh, I'm more interested in knowing how you actually test this as you're, as you're sort of consuming all of these 75 Python modules, how you actually test for various risk conditions and ensure the stability of the metrics that actually the you know, users are serving. Uh, so, his, repeat his question is how do you test this all? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Because we have integration tests for each one of our check, Python checks. The problem is, right now, we are testing the integrations against, let's say, a regular Python interpreter, which is not the embedded Python interpreter. So next step, uh, like right now, what we are going to do is executing. Uh, we have the code to provide uh, the same interpreter you would have in, inside the agent as a standalone binary. So we can use that binary to run the Python code uh, needed to test the checks. So it's, it's not like the same. Uh, that's why we also have end-to-end -end testing 
like we have few reference platforms running the agent and running the, let's say, the 10 most common checks, just to have an idea. So it's not very scientific, but it's reasonably safe. OK, do we, we have time for one more question. I see a hand back there. So, so to repeat the question, if you're starting from scratch, would you do this? OK, so I started writing the agent one year ago. And uh, I, I'm going to kill myself if I have to <laughs> rewrite the agent right now. But no, I, I can't really rewrite the agent in, in Go. I mean, only Go. The question was, if you were, like, there was no agent you were starting from scratch, would you write it all in Go, or would you still take Oh, if, if, it, uh, if it, yes. <laughs> But there's a reason. Uh, like, I had the opportunity to design the software from scratch uh, be because I joined the company at the right time. Or I was lucky. So the point is, it was super easy to design the architecture, the asynchronous architecture with Go. And I would definitely do the same thing if I should start from scratch. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Right. Merci, everyone. Merci. Merci.